ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It is a great honour to welcome you all this evening and to introduce Professor James Tooley, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Buckingham, and Professor Eric Kaufman, the head of Buckingham's new Centre for Heterodox Social Science. I'm Radomir Tylecote, Managing Director of the Legatum Institute. We are delighted and honoured to host our friends from Buckingham this evening. I enjoy using the shorthand simply Buckingham because that word is becoming synonymous with all that we admire and in this country and in the Western world are at risk of losing in scholarship. Shortly, we'll hear from Professor Kaufman, who will lead this vital new initiative. He is also a good friend of ours here at LI. When academia's progressive conformity, as he calls it, tried to cancel him just a few years ago, he refused to conform. And who better to lead Buckingham itself than Professor Tooley, who among many other things is a renowned expert in educational choice and the benefits of low-cost private education in the developing world. Quite right that they should be joined this evening by two titans of contemporary scholarship. These are <laughs> Professor Neil Ferguson and Professor Matthew Goodwin. At Legatum Institute, we believe in national prosperity. That prosperity depends on innovation, distilling good ideas from bad. It is no coincidence that societies which have supported freedom of speech and inquiry have grown rich, and those which did not grew poor. As we are reminded day by day in this country, the threats to our freedom of speech and inquiry are growing in number. Those prepared to make a stand deserve all our support. Shortly, Eric will share with us some extraordinary examples that show why this centre is so vital. But first, please welcome the Vice-Chancellor of the <coughs> University of Buckingham, Professor James Tooley. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to welcome you here this evening on this brutally awful English, it, it was just, uh, the weather is so awful, it's renewed my faith in how awful the weather can be. We're here for a very, very special occasion, the launch of the Centre for Heterodox Social Science. It's really important to me, as you've uh, gathered, that Buckingham is hosting this centre, that Buckingham is really launch, is, is, is providing uh, this centre because so much of what we stand for at Buckingham is for academic freedom, for freedom of speech, and it's so vitally important that we have Eric coming along as a, in a sense, an exile or a refugee from the other universities to come and work with us and work in a different way. Because so many, I don't know how many here are academics, a show of hands, academics, yeah, a few of you. I don't know how many of you have had those instructions from your vice chancellors, from your senior team saying, you must decolonize your curriculum. Okay, at least, oh, well, yes, several people have had that. And what does decolonize your curriculum mean? It means getting rid of pale, male, and stale authors, replacing them with ethnic minorities and women. It means that racism has to be introduced into every program. And that includes subjects like mathematics and chemistry. If you don't believe me, go and visit the Royal Society of Chemistry website and, and, and see how they are involved in that issue of why is my chemistry curriculum white? And there's little place in academia for other ideas. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear because there, there is confusion and misunderstanding here sometimes. At Buckingham, it's not that we are saying we only want ideas like Eric's. It's not that we're saying we want to, in a sense, become orthodox in a different way. We have a multiplicity of ideas. We have people from the left and the right and other, other corners, and we have those ideas shared and enjoyed. We have speakers from all over the 
political spectrum and none. And we must be very, very sure that it doesn't get out that we are only one sort of idea is tolerated there. However, we are really proud that that, Derek, uh, that Eric is joining us. And just a bit about the University of Buckingham, if you don't know this, so Buckingham obviously is situated on the Ark from Oxford to Cambridge, some 50 miles from here. We celebrated the 40th anniversary of our Royal Charter last year, um, but our 50th anniversary of the first students is coming up in two years. Our very first matriculation speech in 1976 was um, uh, conducted, delivered by one Margaret Thatcher. Um, she then went on, in 1976, she became Prime Minister, the first female Prime Minister. There could have been applause at that point, of course, but um, she went on to become uh, a Prime Minister. Um, and she then helped us get our Royal Charter in 83. In 86, 85, we gave her an honorary doctorate when Oxford refused hers. Um, and then she became our much-loved Chancellor. Um, much loved indeed, as indeed our current Chancellor, Dame Mary Archer, is to this day. So we are very much involved with, the his our history is very much integrated and involved with Margaret Thatcher. Those of you may have seen the Times article um, uh, this weekend, it, there was a, a line that I, I said that I was there with Margaret Thatcher on my Shoulder. Did anyone read that and think that sounds like a delusion of grandeur? It, it, it was actually because in my study I have a portrait of Margaret Thatcher as Chancellor behind me and she does in effect sit on my shoulder when I'm talking. But we are here at Buckingham. We are so grateful to Christopher Chandler and the team for welcoming us here to Legatum. I am so happy that we are here to launch the centre and who better to do that than Professor Niall Ferguson to come on. He is someone who really, well, he, well he's the titan, isn't he? The titan, of, uh, the titan of intellectual thought. He is obviously the senior fellow at Hoover Institute in Stanford. Um, he's a trustee of this U, new university of um, uh, Austin, Texas, a dear friend. And please welcome Professor N Neil Ferguson. My name is, is pronounced Neil, and you got it right the second time. And Nile is a river in Egypt, and <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you tonight. When I heard uh, that Eric Kaufman and, and the University of Buckingham were getting together to, great, uh, to create a center for heterodox social science, I was hugely excited. I was excited because I knew uh, what Eric had been through at Birkbeck, and I also know, and I'll come back to this in a minute, just how important the University of Buckingham is and is going to be in the coming struggle over British higher education. And mark my words, the struggle is only just beginning. You ain't seen nothing yet. And I'll tell you why, because very few people have done more to show what's coming uh, than Eric. I don't know how well the people in this room know Eric's work, uh, but anybody who starts his career working on the Orange Order <laughs> immediately wins the respect of a Glaswegian. <laughs> that, that says, has no fear, more than any of the other books, to be honest. I grew up within shouting distance or screaming distance of Ibrooks Park. So this uh, is a book that was calculated to uh, attract my attention. Then came the rise and fall of Anglo-America, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth, and White Shift, uh, the book that I think first propelled uh, him into the realm of controversy. There, there are two epithets to avoid in British academic life. Right-wing professor is one, controversial social scientist <laughs> is the other. And Eric has a new book uh, that is coming out this year yep, May. Uh, with the provocative title Taboo. Uh, but I, I don't want to talk about Eric's books tonight. I, I want to talk about the work that he's done, I guess, illustrating his 
methods on what's been happening in academic life in the Anglosphere, uh, a phrase that I use advisedly. Eric, more than anyone, has been warning uh, over the past couple of years not to expect peak woke anytime soon. If you think that the resignation or firing of Claudine Gay as the president of Harvard represented a turning point, then you should pay more attention uh, to Eric's work. Let me give you three examples to illustrate the point. In a recent survey that he did, uh, he asked academics, I think this was British academics, correct me if, I, if I've got that wrong, uh, to a a a answer whether they agreed or disagreed with the following proposition. My fear of losing my job or reputation due to something I said or posted online is a justified price to pay to protect historically disadvantaged groups. Was it UK yeah. academics? It was. Just to refresh your memories. My fear of losing my job or reputation due to something I said or posted online is a justified price to pay to protect historically disadvantaged groups. By age cohort. Those in their 60s, only 15% were ready to have their reputations destroyed. By the time you're in your 60s, it's too late. 20% of people in their 50s, 30% of academics in their 40s, two-fifths of those in their 30s, 45% of those in their 20s, and when they asked undergraduates, half, half. So the, the pipeline is the problem. Item two, exhibit two from Eric's work. He asked social science and humanities faculty and PhDs in the US, Canada, and the UK. He has an Anglosphere scope in this survey, would you support one or more, he gave, uh, I think, four possible campaigns to oust a faculty member with dissident views, non-progressive views, on parenting, immigration, diversity, equity and inclusion, or empire as a subject close to my own heart. Now, the interesting thing about this survey was what it revealed about the generation gap, particularly in the US. 24%, a quarter of the US faculty said that they would support at least one, and sometimes more than one, of these campaigns to get rid of a fellow faculty member who had unorthodox views on one of those subjects. But amongst PhDs, it was half, 49% of people doing their PhDs in the US said that they would support one or more of these campaigns to oust a faculty member. This is the reality of, of cancel culture. And it's bound to get worse because the Red Guards are just completing their PhDs and bidding for tenure track positions. Exhibit three. Eric asked whether academics uh, all people doing PhDs uh, engaged in discrimination on political grounds. In particular, he asked, do uh, you discriminate against right-leaning grant applications? 20% of US faculty members admitted that they did this. The other 80% were lying. <laughs> and 33% of PhDs said that they did this. So the resignations of a couple of university uh, presidents change nothing. In reality, the cultural revolution in the Anglosphere universities uh, is only going to get worse. And because the Anglosphere is a quite integrated market, because you will find, consider uh, the Director of Studies in History at Donvalin Keyes College, you will find the cross-pollination uh, from the United States uh, to the UK, as well as to Canada and Australia, will only continue, not least because the US produces many more PhDs, many more would-be academics, than it can absorb. So what are we going to do? 
I think the major US universities are now unsalvageable. It would take decades to undo the damage because of all the tenured appointments that have been made on explicitly political or racial or other grounds. In the great universities of the United States over the past 10 years, there has been a crushing decline and fall, a politicization that uh, mocks Max Weber's great distinction between politik and Wissenschaft. Weber rightly said that universities should not be engaged in political activism. And that has ceased to be true at Harvard and at Yale and at Princeton and at the others. So we have to find, find found, uh, new institutions. And that is why I have become involved as a founder in a new university uh, in Austin, Texas. I think that's the only way forward in the United States. But the United Kingdom is a little different. It's roughly where the US was 10 years ago in that only now are institutions declaring proudly that they are initiating decolonization or programs in diversity, equity uh, and inclusion. It's only now beginning uh, at many British institutions. It's of course extraordinary that it's beginning because you would have thought the British institutions would look at what happened to Harvard and the rest and say, for heaven's sake, let's not do that. Let's not destroy ourselves the way Harvard has. But for some strange reason, perhaps they don't uh, have access to news sources from the other side of the Atlantic at Oxford and Cambridge. The entire process is about to repeat itself. It's already underway here. Uh, but that means it's not too late to stop it. And one of the things I've uh, learned in thinking about this over the last few years is that it's remarkable what a small number of institutions can achieve if they go against the current. Think of, for example, the role the University of Chicago's economics department played in pushing back against the great Keynesian consensus. A single department did more than all the other departments combined in many ways to transform the economics profession in the 1970s and 1980s particularly. It, it's, of course, what worked the other way mostly. Uh, the University of Madison, Wisconsin, probably did more than any other institution to turn history in the United States into a left-wing enterprise. But it is important for us to realize that one or two institutions can make a huge difference. And I believe with James uh, at the University of Buckingham, that can be true of the University of Buckingham. And nothing has uh, reinforced my conviction of that more than the creation of this new center for heterodox social science. So the reason I accepted the invitation to come and speak to you tonight is I think it's not too late. It is not too late in this country to prevent what has happened in the US uh, from happening here. And a few institutions can make a much bigger difference than you might think, but it needs support. It cannot be done by the government. It must depend on private philanthropy. If there is one lesson that I've learned in 20 years of working in the United States, it is the enormous power of that force to change the direction of a society. So I would hope, I very much hope, that uh, this evening marks the beginning uh, of a change in the direction of travel in British higher education. That somebody who survived a cancellation campaign uh, and can now set up a new center at uh, the University of Buckingham, Eric exemplifies courage in academia. It's in short supply. It's in very short supply indeed. You're going to hear from Matt in a moment who also personifies courage uh, in social science. Uh, and I hope very much that he will be playing some part uh, in this new center. But let me leave you with this thought. If we go home tonight, or in my case, race to uh, St. Pancras and catch the last Eurostar, thinking that's it, we had our two glasses of wine and we felt better about ourselves, we'll fail. There has to be a concerted effort beginning tonight 
to change the direction of travel in British higher education. If Roger Scruton were here, I know he'd give us his blessing. Uh, and it's in not so much Margaret Thatcher's name, because she was, after all, a politician. But in Roger Scruton's name, that I urge you to give your support to this new and exciting venture. Thanks very much indeed. Well, can I fill those shoes? I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, thank you, Neil. That was uh, very generous. Um, and thank you for coming. Uh, so what I want to do here today in the time I have is simply, first of all, to give an overview of what the problem is and why I think this center is important. Uh, and there are many people who have a part to play. But I just want to talk a little bit about cancel culture first and why, even though we can address cancel culture, it's not going to solve the bigger part of the problem. So with cancel culture, what we're talking about is the university firing, punishing, censoring, no platforming academics for speech, expelling students for speech, and so on. And in this country, you know, I'm pleased to say I, I had some small part to play in the Higher Education Freedom Act. Um, a lot of us in this room did. Uh, and it's going to hopefully do a job in dealing with institutions that would cancel and punish for speech. So there I think we have some progress already in this country. However, however, what is the biggest part of the problem in academia today? I would argue, and in fact there, I can talk about the, the research on this, the much bigger, the iceberg that doesn't make the, the press. We'll hear about prominent cancellations, we'll hear about uh, what happened to, to people like Joe Phoenix, for example, uh, but, and Noah Carl, but will we hear about the everyday political bias and discrimination against colleagues who are holding dissenting views? No, we won't. Um, so that political discrimination is absolutely central in this country, for example, amongst social science scholars, amongst academics who are social scientists. Uh, only one in five leave voting. Yes, there are some academics who voted leave. Only one in five of them would tell that view to a colleague. So four in five are self-censoring their views on Brexit, for example. That's just one example um, of the kind of self-censorship that exists. So what we have here is punishment from the institution. Yes, that's a problem, but we've also got political discrimination from your peers. This then leads to chilling effects. Um, so these are both producing chilling effects, but if you only deal, even if you successfully deal with institutional punishment, you are not dealing with the bigger elephant of political discrimination, which leads to chilling effects. And so you self-censor, not because you think you're going to get fired, but because you think you won't get hired, promoted, uh, funded, um, and you might, may even be socially excluded. Uh, so that's what enforces conformity. Conformity, conformity produces a hostile environment for anybody who's a dissenter. Conservatives, gender critical feminists, they experience a very chilly climate and therefore they say, well, maybe academia, particularly social sciences, that's not really for me, for people like me. What does that mean? It means they select out or they leave and that purifies the monoculture, the left-wing monoculture and particularly the cultural left-wing monoculture in the academy, and the few conservatives and gender, gender critical feminists that remain are in hiding and they don't want to be known, and there are all kinds of studies about this, which again we can talk about. Now that makes all of these problems worse. So once you get a politically homogenous professoriate, it means that the center line, people's touch with reality drifts. That center line drifts to the left, people egg each other on, and they become more radical. You get more fundamentalism. John Ellis, in his book, The Breakdown of Higher Education, talks about this very well. The other thing you get is increasing political discrimination, because if you just think about a 50-50 setup, 50% conservative, 50% on the left, um, you, if you're a conservative, you benefit as much from discrimination for you as against you. But it, once it becomes 10 to 1, which is what it is now in British uh, social science academia, there's 10 people discriminating against you for, and only one in favor of you. You are in big trouble. Uh, and so the more this purifies, the worse these problems get. And this is what's, this kind of doom loop is what we've been trapped into. Now that's kind of the model, and I'm happy to put numbers on any of these boxes, but I want to now just try and give you a vignette, which some of you may have seen recently on social media, which 
kind of tells you the power uh, of this social conformity and ostracism in um, disciplining anybody. And this is not cancel culture from the institution, even though that also happens. This is peer pressure and bias and discrimination. So I'm going to just, oops, sorry. I should say uh, that we, again, we have that higher education freedom bill, which deals with institutional punishment. Um, what we don't have is any way of dealing with that nine to one monoculture uh, in academia, and particularly in social science academia, and anything to deal with that peer driven uh, political prejudice. And that's really where the center comes in because we need to have a critical mass of dissenters that can loosen up the conversation and embolden those who have heterodox views uh, to publish um, and to teach and to sort of put these ideas into our knowledge making institutions. Okay, so I'm gonna just, some of you may have seen this. I collected this, a lot of data. We collected millions of observations on uh, everyday use of force that wasn't lethal. We collected thousands of observations on lethal force. And, and it was in this moment in 2016 that I realized people lose their minds when they don't like the result. So what my paper showed, you'll see tomorrow, uh, like some of you, uh, was that yes, we saw some bias in the low level uses of force every day pushing up against cars and things like that. People tend to like that result, but we didn't find any um, uh, racial bias in police shootings. Now. That was really surprising to me because I expected to see it. The little known fact is I had eight full-time RAs that it took to do this over nearly a year. When I found the surprising result, I hired eight fresh ones and redid it to make sure. They came up with the same exact answer and I thought it was robust and then I went to go give it and my God, all hell broke loose. It was a hundred and four page dense academic economics paper with a 150 page appendix, okay? It was posted for four minutes when I got my first email. This is full of shit. Doesn't make any sense. And I wrote back, how'd you read it that fast? That's amazing. You are a genius. And I had colleagues take me into to the side and say, don't publish this. You'll ruin your career. Mm. I said, what are you talking about? I said, what's wrong with it? Do you believe the first part? Yes. Do you believe the second part? Well, it's the issue is they just don't fit together. We like the first one, but you should publish the, no the second one another time. I said, let me ask this. If the second part about the police shootings, this is a literal conversation. I said to them, if the second part uh, showed bias, do you think I would, should publish it then? And they say, yeah, then it would make sense. And I said, I guarantee you I'll publish it. We'll see what happens. So it was, it was you know, I, I lived under, under um, police protection for about 30 or 40 days. I had a seven day old daughter at the time. I remember going and shopping for because, you know, when you have a newborn, you think you have enough diapers, you don't. So I, I was going to the grocery store to get diapers with the armed guard. It was crazy. It was really, truly crazy. <laughs> so there's Roland Fryer, economist at Harvard. What, what do we do about this peer pressure? I mean, this is really the, the problem, the peer pressure and the monoculture that backs up that peer pressure. Um, so again, I mentioned one of the solutions that I've come up with anyway is that we need to create these centers that provide a critical mass of dissenters that can support each other and actually allow for these ideas to re-enter the public space because they're really being shut down in the universities. Okay. Academia is in crisis. UK legislation addresses cancel culture, but not the dwindling of viewpoint diversity in the professoriate. This is why I'm establishing the Center for Heterodox Social Science at the University of Buckingham. Among social science academics in Britain, the left outnumbers the right nine to one. That's up from three to one in the mid 1960s. The tilt is especially intense at our leading research universities. At Harvard, for example, the conservative to liberal ratio is 82 to one. This is warping the mission of universities away from truth toward social justice values punishment 
and political discrimination are used to enforce orthodoxy, as with Harvard's persecution of dissenting academics such as Roland Fryer. While cancel culture leads to firing, political discrimination causes dissenters to not be hired, promoted, funded, or published. No wonder three quarters of conservative social scientists at leading universities in Britain, Australia, and North America say they self-censor. In fact, just one in five British social scientists who voted leave in the EU referendum would tell that to a colleague. We need spaces where alternative views can flourish, protecting viewpoint diversity. The University of Buckingham is the only one of 181 British universities where this can happen. And while there are such centers in the United States, few of them ask difficult questions in the soft social sciences, such as sociology or psychology. Our mission is to pursue neglected questions and arguments in the social sciences. For example, examining woke as an ideology like any other, which I do in my popular new online course. It means asking whether inequality may be caused by factors other than discrimination. It means probing the high correlation between youth mental illness, far left identification, and LGBT identification. And it means focusing not only on inequality or harm problems, but also on those of social cohesion, freedom, and excellence. For more information, visit us at heterodoxcenter.com. Okay, it's pretty odd watching yourself, but anyway, thanks for uh, <laughs> Well, let's stop by the website then, Heterodox center.com and I urge you to do that as well. The QR codes on the uh, leaflets, you can just scan those as well. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll have a look at the website now. Um, and I just want to show you a few things. Uh, now, hopefully that is going to show up. <laughs> okay, um, maybe not. So I have to signal in there to get the, it's coming, it's coming along. Um, great. Um, yeah, so please do visit the website. I, there's a number of things on here. I'm only going to touch on a few of them. And one is, so we're going to be trying to put out heterodox research. Uh, and in terms of research, this will involve, and I've just got my own think tank reports and books on there. We're going to have academic articles that people can check out. And these are going to explicitly focus on the off-piste subjects that have been neglected or perspectives that have been neglected uh, in the existing social science world. And there, is a lot, there are many, many questions that are not touched upon or are not addressed because they're considered too hot to handle uh, or you, have to, you can only have one potential view on. Teaching, as mentioned, the new course on Woke. Again, there's a leaflet uh, which you can check out on your seat. Um, this, again, is something, again, Woke. Why aren't we studying this? If you look at the newspapers, it is everywhere. If you look at politics, it's starting to make a big impact. It's just too uncomfortable to address uh, in a conventional university. It's something that uh, we want to do. But we want to also expand the teaching program, particularly at the graduate level. That's the vision, is to really expand the master's program. The last thing I'll say is in terms of building a network or serving as a kind of one-stop shop or hub um, for a kind of countercultural academia. And, you know, there's an interesting statistic in humanities that 80% of humanities journal articles are never cited. Uh, the, <laughs> the vast majority of the output of academia is maybe read by one or two people. But that also provides an opportunity. So if we can do impactful social science, so we can get it into ungated journals, for example, that are not controlled by those who would reject right of center perspectives or classical liberal perspectives, uh, perhaps funding bodies as well that are outside the established system in this country, the UK RI system, which is again dominated by the same gatekeepers. Um, get that work in journals, then get it into, for example, either long form media or into think tanks, uh, and also build networks. So the idea there is to create an alternative knowledge production system that can begin to counter the dominance of the existing sort of progressive left um, knowledge production system. And that's impacting the younger generations. As Neil said, uh, I can pull another number out of the hat for you. Um, you know, should J.K. Rowling be dropped by her publisher in this country, 50%, uh, uh, roughly of those who have a view, 50% of the 18 to 25s think she should be dropped by her publisher. Anyone over 45, it's about 3 or 4%. So that kind of gives you a sense of what's coming at us 
uh, these are going to be the, the median voter, the median CEO in about 20 years. Um, building networks with other like-minded institutions is also important for us. And also outreach activities, which I haven't talked about, particularly to schools. We have to begin to reach that younger generation because if we, if we don't, as Neil says, uh, in a way, the, the, the kind of classical liberal culture is, is finished. It's going to be a social justice culture. And I, I don't think we really want to go there. Okay. Um, well, that's it uh, from me. I'm now going to pass it over to uh, Matt Goodwin, who's going to uh, tell us a little bit more. Thank you uh, very much, Eric. I'm conscious of the fact that I'm the last thing between Neil and his um, Eurostar and the last thing between you and a glass of wine. So um, I'm going to keep this very short. Um, I think, in essence, there are two kinds of people in, in this debate, the people who talk about making things happen and then the people who actually make things happen. And um, Neil said sometimes you, you need one or two institutions um, that will make a difference. I think actually sometimes you just need one or two individuals um, who will really go hard at something. Uh, and we've seen that in the US, you know, we've seen it with people like Chris Rufo, uh, who have made an enormous impact uh, on the political culture and the direction of universities where DEI uh, departments are being shut down uh, in many states. I mean, the tide arguably is beginning to turn in, in the US. And I think we need something equivalent in the UK. And I, I think Eric is clearly stepping into that space. And he's typically um, understated um, his role and determination. Eric and I have been on uh, quite a journey together, um, which really started, I think, in 2016, 2017. Um, I mean, I divide my academic career into, into BB and AB, before Brexit and after Brexit. Um, before Brexit, I had lots of friends and it was nice and fun, and after Brexit, things, <laughs> things changed. Um, <laughs> everybody told me they were really liberal and uh, en enlightened. Um, anyway, and uh, Eric and I watched a number of cases unfold. Kathleen Stock was one of them. The one that really got me was Noah Carl, who was a, a very, very talented, is a very talented young researcher and was chased out of his, his job, was sacked basically, lost a very prestigious <laughs> fellowship. And that really paved the way for um, helping to design um, and push through the Higher Education uh, Free Speech Act and the Conservatives in the room. Uh, thank you for putting that in the manifesto and passing it, because I do think over time, that will make a difference. We're already actually beginning to see the culture of elite universities starting to change. For example, Oxford and Cambridge arranging debates that they would not ordinarily have had in response to that legislation. So we're starting to see maybe some, some, some glimmers of hope. Um, because we do very clearly have a problem. Uh, cancellations, uh, student mobbing, self-censorship, um, political discrimination, that there is one thing we haven't mentioned that I think is a massive problem, which is the collapse of public confidence in the universities. Now, if you look at the US, if you look at the Gallup data, uh, Gallup has just shown that public confidence in the universities has never been as low as it is today, especially among Republicans, uh, who I think are looking at universities and increasingly seeing them as, as political indoctrination camps. Um, but if you look at the YouGov data in the UK, more than half of all people in the UK now uh, say that um, university degrees are not value for money. They're not offering value for money. Um, I did some polling just for this event. I asked all um, a, a representative sample of British voters, um, which of these statements comes closest to your view? Uh, universities are more interested in pursuing politically neutral research and teaching than promoting a political agenda or universities are more interested in promoting a political agenda than pursuing politically neutral research and teaching. And more people now feel that universities are more interested in pursuing a political agenda than prioritizing uh, neutral research and teaching. I also asked them how much confidence, if at all, do you have in universities in Britain to uphold free speech and free expression 
on campus, and of those who took a view, they were split straight down the middle. Um, some saying a great deal, some confidence, the same number saying not much, no confidence. Um, the universities, I've come to the conclusion, cannot be trusted to reform themselves. They cannot be trusted to reform themselves because they've been captured. So what we need to do is build up this alternative ecosystem that has centres like Buckingham at the centre of it. Um, we also need parallel institutions like, like Austin in the US and similar institutions like that. Um, but we also, I think, need to be supporting these centres as much as possible. So if there's one thing you can do today or tomorrow after this event beyond um, just networking and having a glass of wine, it's actually telling people about Eric Center. The only way this will work is if people enroll into it and take the courses and, to be blunt, provide the ongoing support that he's going to need to make it viable and to expand it. And if we can turn Buckingham and the centre within it into something that is financially sustainable, that is expanding, you know, that allows Eric to have 10, 15, 20 members of staff over the next couple of years, then we're really on to something. So there is a very specific ask here, and Eric is too diplomatic to say it himself, so I'll say it. Help him recruit students, right? Tell people about his course, tell them to go and check out the website, and I'll see you over a glass of wine uh, shortly. So thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful speeches. I'm going to chair the Q&A now, but I would just say thank you, Neil, for the mention of the late, much-missed Sir Roger Scruton, because he, of course, did the original act that Eric did. Uh, Professor Roger Scruton was unhappy at Birkbeck, and he came to Buckingham. You may have said that already, but that's really the, 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 the precedent for what we're doing with Eric. So let's have questions, comments, observations from the audience. We've got a roving mic, I think. Um, who wants to lead on these? Um, I see a gentleman here. Hello, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Michael Ben Gott from uh, City University. Um, as a representative of the dismal science, so there have been a lot of uh, really gloomy predictions. As a representative of the dismal science, allow me to. Uh, make one that's even more gloomy in a sense, to lower the mood even further. Uh, it could be that all, woke in all its manifestations is going to disappear over the next few years. Um, and not only will it disappear, but all of those who've been fighting within our own institutions to, to, uh, against decolonization and all the, the, the rest of it will also be forgotten. And, but the, the sad thing is it might very well happen because of the external threats that Western democracies are increasingly facing. In other words, um, when things really turn bad, we're not going to be looking to Ibram X. Kendi. We'll be looking to Patrick Blackett, right? To or Isaiah Berlin to uh, to get us through, or to and also to explain to the population why our way of life is worth defending. Thank you. Um, that was sort of dismal. Does anyone want to uh, follow mm. up with that? That sounds like you, Neil. Mm. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll have a go, Michael. I I don't know that it's as as uh, Clear, clear cut as that. In other words, let's assume that we continue to see threats uh, to the West, uh, uh, call it what you like, the Pax Americana, uh, from China, uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Does, does the academy kind of wake up and say, ha, huh, let's, pa let's pause the decolonization of the curriculum and, and study nuclear deterrence? Um, because if, if, if that was going to happen, it would have begun hmm. by now, I would have thought. It's two hmm. years since Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, I see almost no sign of a serious revival uh, of interest in strategic studies. Uh, and American foreign policy continues to be run by the Yale Law School. Uh, so I would love to think that you're right. Uh, but Cold War II has been going for about five years now, in my estimate. And... If anything, the academy has moved further to the left in that time. Why? Because domestic politics matters more. And one of the things that's very striking about the US is the way in which 2016 mattered, but for a different reason. 
uh, the election of Donald Trump actually radicalised mm. and emboldened the scholar activists mm. uh, in the academy uh, in, in ways that were really shocking to me. And I suspect that will happen again if Trump is re-elected mm. uh, in November. So I think domestic politics dominates what happens in universities on both sides of the Atlantic. Excellent. So move the mic along one place, I think, to uh, Dennis. Again, say who you are in case people don't know. Dennis Hayes, Director of Academic Spark Academic Freedom and um, a visiting professor at the University of Buckingham. There you go. I think it's easy to get depressed, but I think there's so many exciting things. This is just one of them. But there are so many free speech groups being set up now. There's the Committee for Academic Freedom, Alumni for Free Speech, and many others that are actually fighting back against what you would call the woke culture. I've got a question for you, Eric, as a to you. Is that, I was at Brussels, at MCC Brussels, discussing um, you know, the change in education, and the people were saying it's all to do with postmodern philosophy. I, I don't believe our challenge is Foucault, right, or anybody else. It's something else. So, woke culture has got strength, and it's been challenged, but what is the basis of woke culture at the present moment? I've got an answer to that, I think, too, but I'd like to know what you think. Let, let's hear Eric's answer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I guess my theory of woke is essentially that this is not driven by cognitive ideas, but by a set of myths and symbols. To put it crudely, majorities are bad to be feared and minorities are good and, and virtuous. And once you buy into that, um, all we've been seeing is the dial's been turned from sort of 7 or 8 to 11. Um, and so whether, you know, whether it's postmodernism or critical theory, uh, I don't actually think that matters very much. I mean, people who say it's all about Marxism, it's all about liberalism, it's all about postmodern, I actually think those are all justifications, elaborate kind of rationalizations. It's a bit like uh, Jonathan Haidt has this metaphor of the elephant, the unconscious, that's really driving you somewhere, and, and the rider is making up a story of why the elephant is moving in that direction. So I'm, I'm less persuaded that any of these high theories are to blame, and I just think this is much more basic. It's about this left liberal identity about always being on the side of the oppressed against the oppressor. Yeah. Excellent. So then, yes. Um, William Clouston from the Social Democratic Party. I agreed with everything that Eric said, except uh, that you said that um, the key task is to get alternative views into the academy. And I would argue that these aren't really alternative views, these are mainstream views. So do you agree that really it's, it's how we point that out and mobilize it that is the key? So why don't I, Eric first and then we'll go over to... <coughs> Well, well, very quickly, I mean, I think they're mainstream in the population. We know that from survey evidence, at least two to one against the woke position. But the people who control, uh, particularly the social sciences within academia, are different from the mass of the population. And they can also leverage taboos against race and, and sexism and LGBT, homophobia, etc. They can leverage those taboos to give them force multiplication. So that's why in the institutions, we're on the back foot. But you're right, in the population, you're absolutely right. They're the mainstream views. Yeah. A little data point on that. I mean, the recent Rasmussen poll, which contrasted the views of the US population with the Ivy League, mm. defined oh, yeah. by people who'd been to elite colleges and had two degrees, it's absolutely hilarious. That's wild things like, you know, you ask older Americans, are you willing to accept uh, rationing of food or fuel to avoid climate change? Like, maybe 10% say yes. If you ask the Ivy League, it's like 90% are ready to impose mm. rationing on the population. Mm. It's all just great and it illustrates something Charles Murray said a long, long time ago, that this huge gap has opened up between what goes on in elite academic institutions and what goes on in real life. And I think that's ultimately extremely dangerous for the universities. I mean, they, they will ultimately be the architects of their own downfall. Mm. Uh, but, but yeah, to your point, it's partly getting uh, mainstream views back into the academy that is the challenge. Yes, and, and I frequently criticise Eric when he talks about what's going on in the mainstream universities. I have to remind him that the University of Buckingham is very much a mainstream <laughs> university, <laughs> with our Royal Charter and all. Um, Claire, come forward here, Mike. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, no, no, sorry. Two very quick and very simple questions. So Mark Stolson from Legatum. Eric, congratulations. You've got a beachhead. The center is a great start, but what is the scale of your ambition? 
and how are you going to pay for it? I said they'd be easy questions. So. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, the scale, I mean, my, the vision that I have is really that in, in a decade, I'd like to be at sort of 20 full-time academics, 10 to 15 postdocs to have graduate programs uh, and to be making an impact in knowledge production and distribution. So that's kind of the, the aim. Um, we're going to have to recruit students. We're going to have to recruit donors if we're going to make this happen. And it's probably a spiral. So we probably need a certain amount of donor capital to be then able to launch programs which can bring student funding in. And that's sort of how I envision it happening, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Does that satisfy you, Mike? <laughs> um, Baroness Fox. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Claire Fox. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to congratulate Eric and also say that everything and anything that we can do at the Academy of Ideas to help you recruit those students, we will do. Uh, we won't be any good on the funding, but we might be able to help with the youth. Um, but I, I, I did want to kind of tease out a question between you and Neil in a way, because um, Neil, you made the point that, you know, we're 10 years behind the US and we shouldn't give up on, on the universities. And I was just thinking about my recruitment for your course, because I don't want to go to all the young students that I know and work with uh, at the Academy of Ideas and sort of say, you know, you can't stay where you are, you've all got to go over there, because there's a danger of a doom and gloom scenario. Because I actually think there's a huge thirst in a substantial minority of students who can feel the weight of conformity on their shoulders in those universities. And I want to encourage them to stay, fight, create take courage and inspiration from you, but how do we kind of get that balance of building new institutions but not destroying the old ones or running away too soon? Yeah. Well, I'll, I can go you, first. You go first. Yeah, so yeah. we've been essentially running the experiments at the University of Austin. That, that in interview that you saw between Barry Weiss and Roland Fryer that, uh, that Eric uh, uh, showed you happened at the University of Austin open weekend for new students. Uh, the first class of students will start this autumn uh, in Austin, just two years after we launched. But we've also run a summer school successfully for students from other universities. Uh, we called it Forbidden Courses. It was courses that you really wouldn't get at Harvard or Stanford, and it was enormously successful. I think you're right. What is really encouraging to me is the response that we got when we launched the University of Austin. Not only did we get thousands of professors writing saying, please can I have a job at your institution? I need to get out of this place. But we also had enormous interest from, from undergraduates. When you look at the Heterodox Academy surveys, 59% of students in undergraduate programs in the US say that they cannot speak their minds in class for fear of their classmates. Nobody really likes this, apart from a very strange minority of red guards. Uh, and so if you build it, they will come. And the great thing is that you can make your content available to people who are outside the University of Buckingham. And I think you're doing that with your online course. So actually, I think you can solve this problem. But there needs to be a hub where it happens, where the content is produced, where the scholars are recruited, where the next generation is trained. That's why you've got to get a PhD program in the mix as soon as you can, and there'll, there'll be opposition to that. Right. <laughs> okay. work, there always is. But I think it's actually possible to spread the word more easily than it ever was before to other institutions. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And I think, yeah, the open online course is an example where we have now several hundred, uh, well, we've had several hundred interests. We've got at least 100 enrolled on the open online part. Um, yeah, so that's just a way. And also getting perhaps some partnerships trying to influence school curricula as well. That's the other area because now the schools are where a lot of it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the importance of a critical mass. You know, it, it's been very lonely at Buckingham being me and now I have a friend. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but, the, but, you know, if there's a critical mass of us, then we can be much stronger. And incidentally, just like, as you were saying, Neil, I'm having many letters this week in particular from disgruntled academics, one or two who are in this room, um, who are, are saying, um, when, when can we join? When can we join? And uh, it's a question of, yeah, I, I would love that to happen. I, as I say, I would love people to come to Buckingham who are reputable academics, who are solid academics, 
but are feeling that discomfort that, uh, that, that Eric mentioned, and they can come and join us, and it'd be so good to, to, to grow that mass. Matt, Matt, do you want to come in on, on, on this? Because you're um, an academic uh, who's I am. looking for... <laughs> do you want to see? Yeah, no, I just... <clears throat> for people who aren't in the universities, I'll give you an example of how this plays out. Um, if I were to go for another academic job, I would have to submit <laughs> something called a diversity statement with that application, where I would have to essentially swear my allegiance to DEI. I'd have to explain how my teaching and my research supports diversity, equity, and inclusion. If I were to apply for a major research grant, which in turn would maximize my chances of promotion, if I wanted to make professor, if I was a lecturer or whatever, I would have to submit a diversity statement. So at every level of the academic system now, you're facing these ideological litmus tests. This should not be happening in higher education, right? This should not be happening. So if we can demonstrate proof of concept which is what this centre is about, demonstrating proof of concept and drawing attention to it. I say to the journalists in the room with uh, uh, very prominent columns in national newspapers, um, if we can actually get a flood of students into this centre, then we've got proof of concept and then we have something we can work with. Uh, so again, please support it. Okay, lady here. Um, thanks very much and congratulations, Eric. My name's Rosie Kay. I'm a choreographer, um, but I'm also co-founder of a new organisation with Denise Farmy, who's here tonight, called Freedom in the Arts. And I think it's just really heartening to see so many enthusiastic people from the world of academia. And I think there's a lot of parallels with the world of the arts. Uh, we have an elite uh, that, that's been quite protected. We have a very dominant ideology in which there's only one set of orthodoxy around a multiplicity of subject matters, and that can change at any moment, and you're on the right or the wrong side of that. And then also we have um, a pipeline system, which is becoming like similar to academia, but in the conservatoire system, is really feeding through artists who now think that they're activists. And I really worry because um, in the applied arts, it only takes a couple of generations where some of those real physical learnt skills, whether that be being able to speak Shakespearean language, being able to dance at a very technical level, being able to do pottery at a very high level, those skills can be lost if artists are only thinking about um, their activism and not their actual craft. So um, I want to ask you around, um, uh, around the sort of theory of woke, wh where do you see the role of art in this conversation? And there's often this idea that politics is downstream of culture or culture is downstream of politics, which is something I know that you're, you're aware of. Like, where do you see the art sitting both, both as a cultural reference, but also within academia? Yeah, a really important uh, question, Rosie, because in reality, actually, academia isn't that distinctive. I mean, the arts are every bit as radical as academia. And of course, the more in academia, the more you move away from engineering and the sciences towards the softer social sciences and the humanities, which are perhaps in some ways closer in spirit to the arts, then you get more radicalism. So yeah, it's the same mind virus in both. Um, and you need dissenters in both, like yourself and like ourselves. So we're kind of fighting the same fight in different spheres. Um, and I think maybe we can, my, 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 the aim might be is if we can produce great art or great social science and get, get a lot of notoriety and attention for our work, whereas all these people are publishing into the void and no one's reading it, then we have to be able to punch well above our weight. And I think that's the goal, uh, is to be able to have big impact for our research or, or, in your case, for your art. And that that can therefore help to change the culture. And that's the hope. Um, thanks. I'm very conscious of the, the <laughs> train that has to be caught and the wine that has to be drunk. So I'm going to take two more questions at the back and then um, here and then we shall finish, so please. Melissa Chen, um, my qu oh, congratulations on launching the center. Um, so I, I really like the idea of, of developing new institutions for competition because that would spur change in the existing uh, institutions. In the US though, I think one of the reasons why you're seeing that happen is because the tech sector has been very open about abolishing requirements, say, for degrees. And so many engineers who are coming through the system, and Peter Thiel was a very early um, supporter of this idea that you don't have to go to university. We'll hire right, you know, whoever's qualified. And I think that's key because if you end up graduating people or researchers from the center, um, where do they end up? So what, what, is the, what is the culture like or intent to kind of dismantle that, 
you know, that mindset of, of credentialism that, that feeds a feedback loop. Um, credentialing, that's how like someone like Kendi, for example, gets to run an anti-racist anti research center at Boston University. Well, yeah, just, just really quickly on that. I mean, we probably won't be able to tackle the way, the way university degrees are used as a sorting mechanism for employers. But, um, you know, what I would say is, is we are going to be able to produce graduates for at least that part of the knowledge economy that is looking for people who have right of center or classical liberal views. And right now, if you go to even the Telegraph, if you go to uh, even conservative MPs, if you go to th think tanks, they have a hard time. Or even in terms of uh, government jobs that are advertised under a Tory government, for example, they can't recruit anyone but progressives for these roles. Uh, or, or very few people who don't have that, that view. So hopefully, if we focus on graduate programs, we'll be able to pr produce graduates. And we also want to run perhaps networking events where we are able to help people who are looking for <laughs> graduates with, with more of this kind of an outlook. Um, so I do think we can serve a function at least to provide um, a matchmaking service in a way uh, for people with you know, a more sort of reality-based outlook and those who are looking for such people. And final, final question. Hello, I'm Amy Shepherd. Um, I think you touched on it already with schools because um, I asked something I'm interested in, how you would approach those. Um, just because obviously university is a very commercialised business now um, and, and students are basically customers and they're sort of half-baked at that point. So you want get, to get to them before they get to that point because it, it's like shutting the door before the horse is bolt. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, after the horse is bolted, sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay, who's... Quick, quick remarks on this. Well, very quickly, I would say you're 100% you're right. All, now we know that by the time someone sets foot on campus, they're already indoctrinated. The universities don't actually make that much difference, which is one reason why we're focusing on graduate education. Um, but yes, we are going to partner with those who want to make change in the K-12, if you want to use the US terms, um, in order to try and get alternative curricula out there. Um, do you, do you uh, Either of you wanted to price say? of liberty's eternal vigilance that schools are particularly the private schools are as much under attack in the UK from the DEI mind virus as the universities and I just urge all of you who are parents the minute you hear that the school is adopting a DEI strategy or has a hard a DEI consultant you should be going straight to the governors and saying what the hell are you doing because that, that's how it begins. That's how it began at Harvard. I remember clearly when it began. And if you want your schools to be destroyed and your educational standards to be destroyed, because this is the thing that follows, uh, then, then do nothing. But you, it's not too late in this country to put up a fight. And you've got all the evidence in front of you from North America of where this leads, which is essentially to educational hell. I'll just, just say also, James, before we round off, um, if you look at what the Labour government is planning to do, uh, the next Labour government, which I wrote about uh, this week, um, it, the, one of the first things they mention is a full curriculum review. Uh, so the expansion of teaching of CRT in schools, teaching about white privilege, they're pretty open about what they want to do. The Racial Equality Act, giving out government contracts on the basis of race and ethnicity. So this will be an extension of the cultural revolution that we've seen. Uh, in the US and so on in recent years. One thing I'd say about my students, so I teach a third year course on European politics. By the time they come to me, you know, there's always a contingent that will say, I feel as though in the last two years I've been indoctrinated. So I've been really looking forward to this course because what you say on X and Twitter is really controversial. <laughs> now I can say to them, well, when you finish this course, you can go to Buckingham and do an MA in uh, <laughs> politics or social sciences or whatever. So maybe the tide has turned. Okay. But we just remind us we don't know that the next government is a Labour. Um, mm. yeah. So look, um, we started late and so we're finishing late. Yeah. But now I would just like to thank once again um, Legatum for hosting this evening. We're so thrilled to be building this relationship with you, to know that there are kindred spirits here in the heart of London and uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for hosting us. Thank you very much.